Welcome to Hope Church Worship Celebration. We're so glad you're joining us today. If you're a member of Hope Church family, we love you so much, and we look forward to gathering together, but we're so thankful we can gather with this broadcast. If you're a member of another church family, we pray for your church to be able to get together soon. We pray for your health and for your finances and in every way. Uh, if you're new to Christ or church and just checking this out, we're especially thankful that you're here. You're our guest and we welcome you. Here's what you can expect. We'll do a couple songs, we'll do a message, then we'll have a couple more songs, and um, we really hope that it's an encouragement to you. So uh, let's get started. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, family. It's so nice to have you all here in my living room this morning, and I am very grateful to be welcomed into yours. And as we do a couple songs today, I just I just wanted to share with you that if you've worshipped together with your family before, a corporate worship in a building, the whole bunch of people you know, that you can experience some amazing things and you can feel a lot in your heart and in your emotion and you can almost be encouraged to sing more. But as we do this on an individual basis, I really um, personally come to this yeah. conclusion that while corporate worship is so fabulous and I love it, there is something very intimate about individual worship and being with, with you and your creator and singing a song or raising your hands. So I encourage you um, to participate and think about that this morning, wherever you are and whatever you're doing. Yeah. 
I sing this next song to my creator, to my friend, and to my savior, who is always with me, no matter where I am and no matter what I'm going through. Thank you. 
we sing to you today. Hey, Hope Church online service. Are you glad to be here today? Welcome. Thank you for joining us. I want to say hi to all our friends and family on the ridge up in Paradise and Miguelia. We love you. And hello to everybody down in Chico and in Orville and the surrounding area in Orland and Red Bluff and up in Redding and down in Volcano and Bakersfield and Wasco. And uh, we got people up at the great Northwest that have been joining us and out in Arizona, all the way to the East Coast. We have people from New York watching us uh, last week. In other countries, people join us. And we're thrilled that while we're all sheltering in place and aren't able to gather together physically like we love to. We're thankful that we have an opportunity to spread the good news of Jesus and connect with each other. And you can write a comment where you're from and that you're with us if you haven't done that. And it's very encouraging to see who's here with us. We're in a series looking at the promises of God because God's promises are something you can count on. You need an anchor in the storm. You need something that you you can put your life in that's certain and God has a great track record and you can count on him. I'm going to go through a little quick review of the promises we've looked at. We The first week we looked at uh, Jesus saying to the disciples who were going to grieve after he died on the cross, he says, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. I believe that last part is not just for those disciples, but because of the empty tomb, we can have a joy that no one can take away, not even a virus. I'm not talking about a happiness from happenings, but a joy inside of us that no one can take away. And then we looked at promise two the next week, and promise two was from the book of Isaiah, and it was at a time when God's people we're going through a hard time uh, because of mistakes and other kingdoms that were coming upon them. And Isaiah says, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And that's from the prophet Isaiah. Then week three, last week, we looked at a promise from David in the Psalms from Psalm 9, 9 and 10. He said, the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. That's a great promise. God never forsakes those who seek him. And that means if you've never done that, you can do that today and God won't forsake you. And God loves you and wants you to come to him. And then today, our promise number four is something from Jesus. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Deep soul weariness. We all experience it in life in different ways. 
and for different reasons. Sometimes we can point to a significant reason and say, this is why I'm bummed out. This is why I'm hurting. This is why I'm wiped out. But sometimes we can't pinpoint what it is. Our weariness results sometimes from layers of things that are built up, not just one thing. Physical pains, emotional heartbreaks, concerns for those we love, and the consequences of sin, whether it's mistakes we make or others make. And these things can weigh us down. We are burdened. We are weary. And they're not relieved, I don't believe, by simple cliches. Oh, cheer up. You're a Christian. Remember, everything's going to work out. I'm a follower of Jesus. I have been for around 40 years. But there are still times that things threaten to scare the crap out of me and cause me to worry. Um, you know, hanging around Jesus, if you were one of the earlier disciples, it wasn't always something easy. One of my favorite leadership verses comes from the Gospel of Mark 10:32. Uh, a leadership when the leader has to lead during difficult times. And it, and it says, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen. Jesus was a strong leader. He's heading for the cross, and his closest disciples are astonished. They're like, man, this Jesus is something else. And the people who were around were afraid. And, and then there was another time they were in a boat, and a storm comes upon them, and Jesus is asleep. And the disciples are afraid, and they wake Jesus up to ask him, crying out to him to save him. And he replied, oh, you of little faith. Why are you so afraid? You know, right about that time, if I was in the boat, I'd have said, well, right now we're in a boat. There's a storm happening, a furious storm. Our boat is filling with water, Jesus. You ever try to explain things to God? You know, like you got to straighten him out a little bit. And then it says that he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. That's what you and I got to understand today. Jesus understands our storm better than anybody. We don't have to explain it to him. The difference maker in the storms, the difference maker in ministry needs, feeding the thousands, healing the sick, casting out demons, the difference maker is Jesus. Clichés aren't going to help the scared and the hurting. But a promise, a promise is different. A promise can relieve a burden if we believe that the power behind the promise is strong enough to relieve our heaviness. And today we're dealing with our own heaviness, our own burdens, our own personal weaknesses, our weariness, but we also have a collective burden we're dealing with a worldwide pandemic. The coronavirus has changed how people live all around the world. And it's invaded our communities, our relationships. It's distanced us. One of the most severe forms of punishment for human beings is solitary confinement. And we are wired for community. That's why I thank God that we can still connect virtually online and through our phone and through calls and emails and texts, and we can Zoom together, we can FaceTime, but it's still not the same as getting together. We have a burden. But into our weariness today, someone is stepping in the greatest power in existence to speak a promise that is hopeful and refreshing. Come to me, he says. Come to me. Jesus' promise is like unlike anyone else in all of history. Any, no other religious leader ever said, come to me. He doesn't say come to a fourfold path to peace-giving enlightenment, like one faith teaches. He doesn't say, here's five pillars of peace through submission, like another faith system teaches. He doesn't give 10 ways to relieve your weariness for us self-help oriented 21st century Americans. 
were so drawn to that. Unlike anyone else in history, Jesus simply offers himself as the universal solution to all that burdens us. Not a solution, the universal solution. Who can make such a claim? It's crazy. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. What keeps Jesus from being a lunatic by making such a claim? When you look at the greater context of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus does miracles to back up his claims. When you look at the context of our text today, Matthew 11, Jesus rebukes towns who were receptive after he did his greatest miracles among them. The purpose of the miracles were not to show off. They, they did do good and help people, but they also were to show that Jesus was who he said. You can, you can read, for example, in the Gospel of John, and it says that it was to prove who he was so that people would put their faith in him. In Matthew 12, the context of today's message promise, the religious leaders saw firsthand the miracles Jesus is doing, and they still reject him. So clearly, he was demonstrating who he is, and still some refused to believe him. The point is, when Jesus said, come to me, he meant believe in who I claim to be and what I am able to do. This is how we're tested. We have these weary burdens in our souls. And will we believe in him and trust him during this time? It's easy to sing, oh, I love Jesus in the building when everything's going wonderful. But what about when things aren't going like we want? Do we trust in him? Do we want to rest our souls on the knowledge of how and when our, our, our burdens are fixed and then we'll rest? When we got the answers about how and when, that's what we want, isn't it? In our flesh, we want to know how and when. He doesn't give us how and when. He does not provide us the details. I'm sorry, I can't give you the details. He just promises that we will be taken care of. And we have to trust. Jesus does not want our souls resting on the how and when as if we're wise enough to understand and determine everything. Probably there's some things in our life that we look back and we're glad we didn't know beforehand how things were going to go. Rather, he wants us and our souls resting on the fact that he will keep his promise to us in the best way and the best time. His ways are not our ways. Come to me, he says. It's kind of like what Peter said, cast all your anxieties on me, for I care about you, in 1 Peter 5, 7. And in Proverbs, trust in me with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. Come to me, Jesus says, and you will find rest for your souls. He says, all you, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. That blows my mind. I'm a I, I, I love people, and I like to try to be open to help people, and I want to be a part of a church that's constantly trying to say yes to any need that we can to help all we can, but there are limits. There's only so much we can do. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. Now, there's two things that hit me on that. One is God's power. All you who are weary come to me. He's, he can handle it. God can handle it. He's creator. And he wants everyone to offload on him. Secondly, God's love. He doesn't want anyone living with heavy burdens and worried on their back. He wants us to be free of that. You're not bothering him by coming to him any time in your life with any of the burdens that you're carrying. He wants you to come to him today. Come to me, he says, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Two reflections, personal reflections from me on the COVID-19. As a pastor and someone that's given my life to the church, and I love the church, 
I believe in the importance of a church. Jesus loved the church. He died for the church. But the church is, uh, you know, it's a family. And sometimes we struggle with people who don't really, they say, yeah, I like the Jesus thing, but I don't want the church. And one of the things that has been encouraging, as we've seen the comments from people who miss being with the church so bad, it proves uh, the importance of the church. We, when you're plugged in as a family, like we're all called to be as sons and daughters and brothers and sisters, you want to be together and you love each other. And I'm so proud of you, Hope Church. You are a true family. You stood through some heavy storms and you still love each other and want to be together. On the other hand, are we at this time falling apart because we can't be with our brothers and sisters? Or are we going to Jesus? Are we using this time to draw near to the only one who can take care of our weariness and our burdens? You know, I can't wait for us to get together again. But the church is a byproduct. The church is not the Savior. Only Jesus can calm the storm. Only Jesus can take the burden off our back. And so the challenge for us during this time of waiting is to go closer to our Lord as we wait until we're all gathered again as a family. He says, and I will give you rest. A little bit farther in the promise, he says, and you will find rest for your souls. Soul rest. That's deep rest. An author, John Bloom, wrote, our souls only find rest in hope. That's what we're frantically looking for when our souls are burdened and restless. Hope sounds like a good name for a church, doesn't it? And he continues, and that's what most of the marketing of most of the products in the world try to offer us, hope. But they are false hopes for soul rest, providing only temporary distractions from our briefly uh, or briefly masking the effects of our burdened souls. They don't truly lighten our loads. There's only one place to find soul rest for our weary and burdened souls. David wrote in Psalm 62, five through seven, yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Jesus knows that he alone is our salvation, our fortress, our mighty rock, our refuge. He's the one who can answer every question, every concern, every fear and need we have. And so he simply offers himself. Our hope is from him. Only in him will we find rest for our souls. And then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. What is this yoke? Wait a minute, Jesus, you were just talking about rest. Now are you you're giving us a burden to carry? I thought we we're gonna rest, which is it? A yoke was used to put on an animal to pull weight, to pull a plow or a cart or, or something. And, and you'd have two animals connected in a yoke and they could pull more. And of course, there's the idea that if you're yoked with Jesus, he really carries the load uh, when we, we get to the point where we can go no more. A yoke was harnessed upon uh, on oxen. And, and they would connect these animals to ease the hauling of the load. But it was also used as a metaphor when people were carrying a burden or a task. A yoke was placed onto them to submit. A younger ox connected to a more experienced one learns how to pull. It's a, it's a picture of a discipleship, of mentoring. The younger, inexperienced learns from the experience who knows where they're going. A yoke is a picture of submission. Take my yoke upon you. But what? What's the yoke if we're called to rest? 
is it work or rest? In John 6, 29, Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe in him who has sent you. Okay, believe is not really work. In John 15, 4, he says, abide in me like a branch and a vine. You have to abide in him to bear fruit, to exist, to produce. Believe and abide. Live in him. This is really the yoke, believing and abiding, trusting in him and all the promises that God gives. That's the yoke Jesus calls us to put on. You know what else? It was also used to refer to a rabbi's teaching and lifestyle in Jesus's day. A rabbi had a yoke. You would take on his yoke when you became a follower. During the lifetime of Jesus, there were four things any disciple uh, that was following any particular rabbi, four things that you could tell. One, once they, one, they memorized the words of their, their, their rabbi. Two, they adapted his interpretation of scripture. Um, they didn't say, I say, they would say, Rabbi so-and-so says this. Rabbi Gamal says this. Jesus shows up, I say unto you. And so disciples of Jesus adopt his interpretation of script, scripture. Three, they imitated his ministry and model. And four, they multiplied his teaching to future disciples. In the time of Jesus, taking the yoke of the rabbi reflected a disciple's willing submission and adherence to his rabbi's interpretation and application of the Old Testament scriptures. So Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. And he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I think that word my shows he's doing a contrast to some people who are pressed by other rabbis and leaders and Pharisees. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. In contrast to the burden of the Pharisees, Jesus' disciples are following him, and he, he's walking with them. And in the context, the Pharisees are like paparazzi on stars, they're, trying, they're just constantly following Jesus, but they're trying to catch him doing something wrong. His disciples in chapter 12 on the Sabbath break off heads of grain and eat. They say, hey, you're, you're working on the Sabbath. They had all these rules of what it meant to do on the Sabbath. And it was like, you can't pick your nose on the Sabbath because that's work. And they're trying to find you know, an excuse. And Jesus says, hey, don't you remember that David who they took great pride in, ate the bread, him and his companions from the temple that was meant for ministry and for the priests. And so he's saying, it's interesting that you uh, don't find fault in David, but you're finding fault in this little thing here of these people that are eating grain. A little farther in chapter 12, uh, on the Sabbath again, there's a man with a shriveled hand. And they're watching Jesus to see if, they heal. In Mark's account of this, it says that Jesus looked at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Jesus is so angry at the religious leaders. This is his day. This is where he grew up. This is his leaders of his community. And he's so angry that they care more about their man-made rules than a man with a shriveled hand. And they want to try to get Jesus doing something quote-unquote wrong. Well, Jesus uh, rocks the church that day. He tells the man, stand up. He could have said, well, let's wait till Monday. No, not Jesus. Stand up in front of everybody. And he heals this person. And now we see what Jesus is like. Now we see the interpretation of Scripture from Jesus. Now we see why he said, I am Lord over Sabbath. And Sabbath, man was not made for Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. It was not made to oppress people. It was to help people rest and have a day devoted to God. And so he says, how much more valuable is a person than sheep? Jesus makes a scene in church because he cares so much for bringing people healing 
and peace. And today, he wants to bring us rest, not a religion, not a gospel of behavioralism, but peace and rest. That's his yoke. His interpretation of scripture, that we're to take home from Jesus, that the heart and the spirit of God is love and grace, that law uh, taught us about right and wrong, but law showed us we can't keep it perfectly, and it showed us our need for grace, and it brings us to, to Christ where we find forgiveness, and in Christ, we have this grace and this everlasting love. Three, three action words, come, take, learn. Come to me, Jesus says, all you. Anybody can come. Doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made, how far you, apart you think you are. Listen, I've got so many mess ups in my life, and that's um, such good news that we get a do over with Jesus every day. We can start over. He says, Come to me, all ye who are weary. And then he says, Take, take my yoke upon you. Follow me and learn from me. Come, take, learn. That's exactly what we need to be doing during this time of shelter in place, coming to him in prayer and in scripture, spreading his ministry model online in any way we can, sharing his love in any way we can. I know you are weary and you are burdened today. There's one place to find rest for our souls, soul rest, only one place that will give us total, complete soul rest. Listen again to today's promise from Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Today, Jesus is gentle, and humble in heart, and wants to give you rest for your soul. Focus on his love. He is our shelter in this storm. His arms are out for all of us to come to him today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love, your matchless love. Thank you that Jesus came not with oppression, but with arms open wide for anyone to come to him, and that as we come to him, and we follow him, we find rest deep in our souls. I give, I give this prayer for anyone that's feeling especially burdened this week. God, give them rest in their soul. Help them to rest in you and carry that burden, Lord. Take it. And we commit um, to spread your love in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Hey Hope, we love you guys so much and we miss you and we're just thankful that you're staying patient with us and joining our worship anyways throughout this pandemic and we miss you and we can't wait to give you all big hugs when we come back and meet together and yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you. 
you and we hope to see you soon. He loves us. He loves whoever's watching this. He's crazy about you and sent a son for you. Hey, if we can help you in any way, you can write me at stanfreitas at gmail.com. You can go to our website, hopechurchparadise.com, and contact us through that. Let us know. Also, if you made any decision to follow the Lord or if you have a prayer request that we can confidentially pray for, um, we're here to serve in any way we can. And we really appreciate you joining us. And now it's time to pray for our offering. Yay. Uh, if you uh, want to give online to Hope Church and our ministry, you can give at hopechurchparadise.com. Uh, Just find the Give button and click on that. If you would like to mail it in, you can mail it to Hope Christian Church, P.O. Box 397. That's Paradise, California, 95967. Uh, if you want to drop it off at our location in Miguel, 14126. Skyway in Megalia. One of the cool things about leasing a video building is we have a Dropbox, and you can drop that in the Dropbox on the right of our entrance on your right, and our treasurer Kim will take care of that. Uh, but we appreciate it. Let's pray together. Uh, Father, I I pray for um, us to be a force of hope on the ridge and beyond. That's something we prayed since we began together. We had our ideas of how that would happen. We have never thought it would be this way, but it's actually happening through this broadcast to go beyond the ridge, and we give you praise. 
And Father, we want you to be honored. That's our, our hope and our prayer. So please provide for our needs and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, before we have one more great song that's going to touch your heart, what is our purpose? Building relationships that last forever. How do we do that? Love God. Love people. So remember, every single day this week, in Christ, we always have hope. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Hope. Welcome to my garage. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. These are some crazy times that we're in. But we're children of a God that I know is going to take this situation and our fear and turn it into blessing. So let's just focus on that this morning and let's worship him. Amen. Every anxious thought that steals my breath. Is a heavy weight upon my chest as I lie awake and wonder what the future will hold. Help me to remember that you're in control. You're my courage when I worry in the dead of night. You're my strength because I'm not strong enough to win in this fight. You are greater than the battle raging in my mind. I will trust you more. I will fear no more. I will lift my eyes. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in today, Hope. Um, stay healthy, stay safe, stay sane. Reach out to us if you need anything from us. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Gina now to close us out. I love you, Hope.
Hope, we are so thankful and so blessed that you have invited us into your living room. And for those of you, this is your first time with us. We are so grateful that you have allowed us um, the honor of being part of your Sunday morning. And we hope that you will join us again. Don't be lonely. I know that it's hard when we can't physically be together, but there are other ways that we can connect. And we are here for you. We love you. And we are praying for you every day. So as a whole, we want to tell you all um, goodbye and how grateful we are that you are here with us. And so we love you, Hope. We hope you have a wonderful Sunday afternoon, a great week, and we will see you again.